lastly, this is an important area. We need to have uh, discussions with the public, with the people working in different industries, and to assess, for example, the missions, which missions should we actually go for, uh, and also to sort of uh, influence the strategy and to listen and to have a response so that the strategy can be sort of continuously uh, developed. So that's our uh, input to how we believe that uh, this development should be, uh, should be sort of um, uh, go further on. Uh, so uh, with that, I hope you have a very good conference. Bear this in mind. Uh, thank you very much. Can you? Okay. At least I tried, right? Thank you so much, uh, Hilde. Uh, speaking of uh, digital things and data, well, I tried to kind of split uh, where I write things. So, hence my phone and my paper. If you need to write something that you don't want anyone to read, you can just burn it afterwards. Um, so, the next speaker uh, will be taking on a topic that is quite fiercely debated in Norway these days. Uh, I think I saw something in the lines of saving the world through <laughs> impact. I think you may know who uh, is the next one up. His name is Anders Lier. He is a well-known uh, person in the tech innovation and impact scene here in Oslo and in Norway. Also abroad, I'm understanding. Welcome to the stage, Anders. Tusen tack. Tack, tack. Tack. Thank you very much. Uh, I kind of agree and disagree. Uh, data and trust uh, is the key differentiator for this nation, yes or no. I just came back from China. I don't think we could actually be uh, having an edge on data. Uh, there are a little bit more data over there. Uh, and if we look at the social credit score, etc., I think that they will beat us like uh, red and blue. But there are nuances to that, Hilda, I know. Uh, at the same time, trust, I think the most important factor in this world, in this uh, turmoil, with this distrust going on, I think trust will be one of the key factors of redefining the democracies of the world. And we, from Norway, from the Nordics, could play a very significant role for the world in that aspect. So, my name is Anders. I'm uh, a part of the Catapult uh, organization. We are impact investors. My angle to uh, AI is coming from B or Handelshögskolen, so I don't really know much. Uh, but I'm very focused on the commercial aspects of it. And the reason why I'm, I'm investing in AI is the following. Uh, where do I point? Oh, that's the following. So uh, it's obvious which planet we want to live on. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I joined the Norwegian state delegation to China. And on the Monday in Beijing, the air pollution was in category six. Category six and, and index for 213, I think. That means that the air pollution is so bad, so the kids has to be at home because it's dangerous for them to be on, in the schools. And who want to live in that world? We don't want to live in that. So we want to actually um, make all the capital in the world to be deployed into good purposes for the, this, for the environment and for the, for the society. We call it impact investing. Impact investing is about solving the grand challenges of the world and making a lot of profit. Most people say, oh, isn't that charity, grants giving philanthropy? Are, are you having a trade-off on financial return? No, not at all. I believe that by solving the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals defined by FUN, and, and the biggest problems in the world are the biggest business opportunities. And I don't plan to buy a yacht or a private jet or anything, so we will recycle our cash back to new projects and new uh, initiatives. So in, in Catapult, we invest and support in early stage tech companies, all impact driven. 
And we also want to uh, use exponential technologies and, and primarily artificial intelligence because I believe that AI will be for the society like it's like oxygen for me as a human being. It will be everywhere. You could just look at the income statement or the balance sheet, all the lines for any businesses, it will be influenced, I, I think. And, and I think we need to take a lead. The world needs a lead. And, and I think the Nordic has the opportunity to take lead in, in several aspects of this. I will explain later on why. And uh, I think the introduction here by the, the two gentlemen from the university, Morten and, and his uh, counterpart, was very nice and very uh, excellent, excellent. And there's no, no kind of, uh, it's a no-brainer to see the opportunities. And, and these two, uh, and, and the quotes from these two are, is, is clearly that the business opportunities are massive. And uh, uh, I think uh, one of you guys talked about the, the hardware advancements on the stage. And of course, the hardware advancements are there fully. And, and with the recent development on, on quantum computing, we'll see just more and more hardware capacity. But uh, I also would see that, um, that uh, of course, you need data and data sets. And yes, there are data sets in the, in the Nordics, which are, are great, uh, maybe in the healthcare sector, which we could actually have an edge globally. But at the, uh, but at the same time, you see that um, Europe, uh, due to GDPR, uh, what uh, GDPR or something, yeah, uh, it it's, uh, might be a hinder to actually uh, uh, quantum leap the, the position on AI. And, and that's a sad thing, but uh, I think that's the real fact. And if you look at China, uh, they have a massive access to data. But not only them, of course, I think you talked about the big three or four in, in the previous speech and Google, Amazon, Facebook, all these have a lot of data, but there will be more and more data available. And of course, when we have all the Internet of Things and IOTA actually put up a platform where we have zero co transaction cost, if that happens, we will have uh, even more data available. And there is a big, big appetite for acquiring AI companies. Uh, you, you can see that there was a lot of acquisitions last year uh, and uh, Google and Apple, they are driving it. But also a Norwegian gentleman called Jörn Lysegen, which you may, may know from Meltwater, he was the f uh, number fifth on the, on the list of the top five acquir uh, acquiring uh, companies in the world in AI space. So we see a, a big movement and of course that's a strong uh, underly uh, underlying um, platform for us when we invest in AI. Uh, and then if you look at the, the tech life cycle, uh, there has been uh, a lot of heavy R&D spend. Uh, uh, I think uh, AI was invented in, uh, as a term it's in the 50s or something. Uh, and, and of course, there's been a long journey. But with the data sets and with the computing power, we see that we are kind of maturing into applied AI solutions and new category leaders. And uh, uh, we have a fund called Catapult Fund, we're raising now, we have uh, um, a target of raising 1 billion kroner. We have uh, 250 million kroner closed already, uh, which is the first close this uh, Christmas. And um, it's interesting to see because I just uh, 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 ended a global tour where I went and met investors in California, in Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, and, and then I went on to Israel. And the guys who are the most interested to invest, to invest in, the, in Nordic AI companies, can you guess who they are? Yeah, it's, it's the Chinese. And uh, the door is closed for Silicon Valley now for China because Trump doesn't want them in there. So then they, they look for other opportunities and they need technologies to solve their big problems like the air pollution. So the biggest investors we have in our funds are, are Chinese and then Israelian ones and then some Norwegians. And we do this because we want to create a new future for Norway. We need to leave the oil in the ground. That's not sustainable to continue the fossil driven uh, economy we have. And that's why we invest in AI. And I think we, we need to have the capital in Norway to also to understand that or the people managing that capital and deploy into this fantastic business opportunities. 
So uh, looking at uh, the technology life cycle and, and that uh, technology evolution, we have put up a map uh, we're on the right hand side. We, we see there's so many, many uh, business opportunities. We are actually assessing 140 AI startups in the Nordics right now with our team, which we are considering to invest in. And then you could you could debate where you want to put all this stuff, and and uh, I think that uh, longevity and and hyperloop uh, uh, we will not see that in the next five years to come, but it it, it will come uh, absolutely. I believe that longevity will be one of the biggest business opportunities there, there is, uh, and I hope to be 150 years personally, but we'll see. Uh, but if, on this side, there is is so many opportunities right now, but. There is an abundance of capital in the world. We have the largest sovereign fund in the world in Norway, uh, uh, but but we need uh, so the capital will come and and people will understand. So uh, when the Chinese will invest into the Nordics, when the Israelis will invest in, and the Americans, and I have a lot of friends who has funds out there which actually only invest in the Nordics now, but. <clears throat> I think the key is not the capital, the key is access to the smart founders. And what we, we worked very hard on uh, is to build an ecosystem where we actually get access to the best uh, founders. And, and the ecosystem is, is uh, built around the uh, Catapult uh, Accelerator. Yesterday we had a, a launch night on, on the Catapult Accelerator where we presented 11 companies. We had 1,500 startups from more than 110 countries applying to the Accelerator. Accelerators is a startup program for 90 days. It's kind of the most intensive school you could go to. And, uh, and these companies, these 1,500 uh, startups wanted to come to Norway. And why? Because this is a great place to be. I mean, we have a lot to offer. Of course, the way we organized our society, the legacy of the social democratic uh, kind of uh, platform, the, the trust, uh, the, the tech savviness, the short way to the market, etc., etc., etc. So we have a proprietary uh, deal flow from the, from the Catapult Future Fest, but we also have made a global network where we actually source uh, AI startups. And sadly, there is not enough an, uh, AI companies for the size of our funds so in the Nordics, so we're going to invest outside the Nordics too. And uh, we just recently invested in four companies on YC. Uh, so maybe some of you heard about Y Combinator YC, which is the, the, the kind of the leading accelerator in the world. Uh, and still we did some uh, autonomous vessels, so that might be of interest to you. And, and this deal flow uh, uh, is, is going to be the key because uh, it's, it's, it's an abundance of capital, but there's a scarcity of great founders who do AI. So the only opportunity you have is to kind of, you have to be their friend. And it doesn't help to have, let's say, 10 billion coming out of China. You cannot really buy Silicon Valley. You need to kind of be the friend of the founders. And we are a team of uh, serial entrepreneurs who actually are deeply engaged into the environment. And, and that's, the, that's the edge. And I'll give you one example. Uh, it's not a Norwegian one. Uh, it's, it's a one from Harvard. Uh, and uh, Alan, the professor, he, he is the founder here. And he put up Kebotics uh, earlier this year. And he used AI and robotics to, to, to kind of uh, invent new drugs uh, based on uh, material science. And um, there were only five investors allowed into there. Uh, the big, uh, the big, the really big ones want to come in, but it it was not possible because we, through Anders uh, Fröset uh, and uh, friends, uh, have kind of been able to to support Alan. And by the way, he left Harvard now uh, because of Trump, and then uh, he is in Toronto. So interesting. Yeah. Uh, surprise, surprise. Five more minutes. Yeah. Or something like that okay so um so there 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 will be uh, uh, for us it will be a tremendous of business opportunities but we want to kind of drive um uh, ai from the perspective of uh the norwegian and the nordic heritage uh, the culture uh, the the way we organize our societies the way we live and i think that uh one very um uh, the, a dangerous aspect of AI is the kind of the hidden uh, biases in the data sets. And uh, we all know that, for instance, uh, gender and uh, race is strongly correlated to what kind of career you have and what salary you have. 
And I think that's that's really, really bad. That's disastrous. We need to fight those things, all this hidden information in the data sets. And especially in the light of fake news, it's like, it's like fake news is the new standard and, and we need to fight this. Unfortunately, I will probably not be able to influence Mark Zuckerberg or, uh, or the guys in Google. But what we want to do is to kind of uh, put up, uh, and we are working on that now, is to uh, make a, a foundation. We call it Norwegian.ai. And, and we want to make sure that all the startups we touch, all the startups we talk to, all the startups we engage in and invest in, uh, are working according to a framework, framework of uh, responsible and ethical uh, guidelines. So we have uh, recruited uh, Roman Chowdhury. She's head of ethical AI worldwide in Accenture. She works 30% for us and the rest of her time with Accenture. She wrote the, the, the guidelines and I mean, we are looking for the new Elon Musk of the world and, and they are out there. We're going to find them and we're going to build them and, and we hope that we could find 7 billion of them because then we could get this planet uh, green also in 2066. But, uh, um, but we need them to kind of make sure that the technology is used the best for the humankind. So that's why we put up this framework and, and, and I, I presented it to Hilda and, and we want to kind of have everyone joining us on that. But we are driving this as a private investors uh, and, and we feel this is a very important thing that's why we also put a lot of our own money into it and the team uh, we are a team of serial entrepreneurs in uh, Tarel and I we, we worked in Catpool for a long time and then we have Chris Alexander Edward which are young uh, guys serial entrepreneurs living in New York and San Francisco uh, and then we have recruited Alice and she's one of the leading impact uh, part uh, impact persons in the world together with Charlie Kleichner uh, so, so the team is there and Trun is helping us a lot, he's a tremendous resource for building the ecosystem in the Nordics, so thanks Trun for joining us. And what we want to achieve is this, uh, and I think it's possible, but there is no time to waste, it's, less, it's, it's, it's about 4000 days to 2030. And, uh, and uh, we need to work hard and I'm not able to put in more hours. Not at all, but uh, I think that if you jump on exponential curves, it's an exponential mindset, it's an exponential way to organize uh, how we work, but it's also about benefiting exponential technology, AI. So that's what we do in order to create this and, and take care of a green planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Anders. Um, in one of my previous jobs, I worked on a project with some researchers from Big Insight, which is a research group at the University of Oslo, and we worked on commercializing um, a piece of technology on predictive analytics. And I would be very happy if there would be something that could predict that I would uh, tear a hole in my stocking so that I could have brought an extra one. But, uh, you know, it's all about the everyday application, right? So we're a bit behind schedule, so I'm just going to be very quick and introduce our next uh, speaker, Eva Martinekaite, Vice President uh, from Telenor. Um, she is what I would call an expert in AI. Of course, need to be very careful to use the expert term. Uh, Eva, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get it right. No, I think he didn't. Of course he did. Let's put it. Okay, I'll put it here. All right. Thanks a lot for having me here. Um, I have 10 minutes, right? And um, my plan today is actually give a little bit like a um, uh, down-to-earth approach to AI. I actually also finished BI. I have a PhD from VI and actually I value that education because this is um, this what brings you a little bit more thinking around the technologies, not only technology, but also, you know, how to really build business out of it. So um, I work in Telenor. Um, I've been in Telenor for almost four years um, with a PhD in strategy from BI. I also um, my job in Telenor, as I call it today, is to, um, you know, to drive community thinking in AI and actually build or help building the ecosystem for Norway. I also sit in um, the so-called European High Level Expert Group on AI. 
Um, this is sort of an expert group created by the European Commission uh, asking 52 experts today to help European Union to build a strategy for AI. So I'll talk today about what it actually means to build AI ecosystem for the big business. I know Telenor uh, is a big company. We are, you know, many people know it in Norway, so I don't have to introduce it. So what it means for the big corporate uh, to work with AI and actually work in Norway with AI, and what it means for Telenor to do it. So um, let me start with, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, how do I do it? Okay, doesn't work. So maybe, uh, yeah. All right, so I will have several slides only for just for your inspiration. And that comes from my own experience by uh, being in that game for a couple of years already. And also from the corporate perspective, just to, to get you um, uh, know it. I don't know, something is uh, probably clicking somewhere, right? Am I doing something wrong? Okay, so my first, or my first message, um, and uh, you know, Anders, you were actually absolutely right. This is a global race for excellence. Uh, AI is going to change the world. We can talk about it for ages. But what it seems to be happening at the moment, it seems that there are big players, uh, government players in the world that are building that capability big time. So if someone asked me what is Norway, what is for Norway? I mean, how can we compete? Coming from a big corporate, global corporate, my first message would be, think global from the first day. It's about creating global competitiveness with AI. So I think what Norway could do, and we're very good at some of the areas and some of the industries to prioritize. Select the top industries that are global today, that have been investing in digital technologies already for many years, that have talents which would be quite easy to retrain, and that have sustainable solutions already. And you can name at least in my head, there are at least three industries, probably more, but at least three industries where Norway compete, glo competes globally today. This is energy, maritime and fishing. So my one kind of approach or the win, must win battle in the global game of AI would be to prioritize and specialize. AI is an enabling technology and we should probably think where to actually specialize. We can't be good at everything. So we should probably start thinking about how Norway can look in the AI globally. And I would suggest going into those industries and start really investing in critical talents, in critical research, in critical applications that can actually help us to compete globally. Um, the second thing, um, I don't know why it's not working. Can I just click? Now how to do this? This is collaboration. My second message, I mean, we have to get this right. It's about research, industry, and government. We have to set the ambition. I hope it's coming. We've been working a lot. Many of you sitting here have been lot working on to that. But it has to be a collaboration, and Norway is actually very good at that. I learned about that new word when I came to Norway, dugnad. I didn't know that word, but actually this is about this. The oil industry actually grew in Norway because we actually managed to run this. AI develops in the ecosystem. We need private and public investments. We need talents. We need infrastructure. We need data access. And that only comes if we have that collaboration right. I have one side note to that. We are small, actually. Believe me, we are very small, Norway as such. So I would encourage to think community, one, rather than several, in building this. My third message, 
Uh, is this? Talents first. Investments are important. But if you look at how the ecosystems, the top level ecosystems in the world has been built in AI, and I refer to Canada, I refer to Singapore now increasingly, it's a bit different model, but still, what they first did is they picked out the top research talents. You need to build those in Norway. And I'm so happy that this university and other universities in Norway are trying to do that. But we need more. This is not enough. We need to stand high on the research frontier to push the edge. And you need investments. You need to be a bit strategic where you invest in research. I call Norway for being that strategic. My fourth, um, it's very important. AI is one of technologies. It's not developing in isolation of other technology evolutions. Coming from the telco world, the way we see and promote or try to sort of also invest in, we see AI as the enabling technology within or in the outskirts of IoT and 5G. This country needs new sources of data to build competitiveness in AI. Not only this, I would say Europe generally. This is probably not going to be B2C business. It's gone almost, I think. It's B2B markets. It's the large industries that would probably benefit from building machine learning applications on IoT data. And it's coming. So we need to see AI, it's not like an isolation, but it's actually part of the overall technology architecture that's coming. Um, and then the last thing, we have to get this right too. It's a no-brainer almost now. We have to build a strong ethical and moral AI. And um, coming from the business side, I truly believe in that. that if we have this as an enabler for business, we can win. Europe actually wants to set the global standard for ethical and trusted AI. And that's what the expert group is trying to kind of really understand how can we do it. It's not easy. It's very, very complex. But if we get this right, we will build trust in the society. And if we do that, the adoption would be much easier. But, you know, it's tough. And I have two examples. Uh, from Telenor to actually explain why we did it. It's not very important what is in there, but why are we doing this? Two years ago, we have, we thought like, okay, being a big company with a very strong legacy in Norway, with the owner in Norway, we said, okay, how can Telenor contribute to the development and also the debate about artificial intelligence upbringing in Norway? And we said, okay, instead of talking about it, let's do something about it. So we put 50 million Norwegian kroners in establishing an activity at that time, it was so obvious that Antenu is a is, is very obvious choice for us to kind of come and say, OK, shall we build the lab together? It's a gift from us. We don't expect commissioned research. That's not what we do with this initiative. We want to build talents, but we don't necessarily know how to do it. We're not good at that. Because it's not only that the universities will win from that, but all industries will win. And our message behind that back in 2016 was, right, we are doing that because we believe that this country needs talents and we're doing that because we need more people to come on stage and start talking about it, try to invest in it, try to do research on it, try to create a momentum. And I think we were lucky in a way. We were, we were happy to see other four industries joining uh, the industry sort of driven uh, AI uh, laboratory 
in Trondheim. I'm also happy to see that there are activities now in Oslo with other universities that are also pushing the frontier. As Telenor, we, what we want to see is we want to see more talents, more research, more investments. I mean, we need to scale and actually do a great job. And then the last, uh, my last line, exactly this one, as I said in the beginning, we as Telenor, we, we, we want to get, you know, the uh, closer to the debate that's going on in Europe. We said, right, if there's a place where we want to be early in the debate, this is European Union, because we believe these are the values, the fundamental values that we believe in, on trusted AI, on investment and policies in AI. So we joined, we're happy to be among those 52 experts today, the only ones from Norway, to actually be in the debate, discuss with other industry partners and university professors on how can Europe scale, where to invest, and also how to build that trusted AI. So these are two examples to explain why a company like Telenor is actually trying to create that momentum. My last, uh, to finish my speech, I think Norway has very good chances to be um, among the winners. We need to act. Um, let's not wait until the future hits us. As Martin says, let's create the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eva. Okay, so the last speaker, before we hit for a coffee break and you get to discuss uh, everything our speakers have been uh, talking about, I'm really looking forward to having him on stage. He is a, a, um, a senior policy analyst from the OECD. He's uh, with the Directory for Science, Technology and Innovation and he's going to speak to us about a number of uh, topics but I'm especially looking forward to what he's going to tell us about how AI impacts the labour market. So welcome to the stage, Alistair Nolan. Thank you. Okay. Is this okay? Well, thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you in particular to Oslo Met and to, to Morton for having invited me. We had the OECD yesterday, a wonderful, and for the last two days, a wonderful conference on a variety of digital technologies uh, co-hosted uh, between the OECD and, um, and Oslo Met, and that was, uh, that was a superb partnership. I'm going to talk about a number of issues connected with public policy, particularly around education and skills, building on OECD data. You're probably all familiar with the PISA study that measures in curriculum, uh, in language and in culturally neutral ways, the objectively the generic skills of 15 year olds around the world. I'll talk about this and I'll also talk about a successor to PISA, which is the PIAC study. I'd emphasize um, what a number of speakers have already said, but I'd add a few nuances about why we need effective AI. Uh, one of the background reasons is because we are experiencing a decline in the rate of productivity growth, which has been particularly acute since the end of the financial crisis. And that's indicated by the red bar here, and it's on productivity growth that our long-term living standards depend. We also need effective AI because the old age dependency ratio, the ratio between those who are out of the workforce on account of the demographic change, this will double in the developed world over the next 35 years. We're all moving in the direction of Japan, where, for instance, the average age of a farmer is 66. 20% of tractor accidents in Japan occur with tractor drivers who are 80 or older. We're all going that way, and so we need the intelligent robotic tractor systems as well as uh, um, a multiplicity of other ways in which AI will help counter demographic transition, demographic change. We also need effective AI in science because there's some evidence from scholars that research productivity may be falling. So you see the number of researchers required today to achieve Moore's law, the famous doubling every two years of the density of computer chips, that number is 18 times greater than the number required in the early 1970s. So we need AI in science. Now, we could talk all day about the 
possible impacts, the prospective impacts of AI on future occupations and skills. I'm just going to make a couple of points and then, if the clicker works, build on, um, build on some OECD data. So the first thing I would say is that clearly we need more skills, more digital skills, and more skills that complement rather than compete with machines. There's a lot of empirical evidence substantiating the truth of these propositions. However, they're not very useful. They're not there. They're self-evident. So um, what can we say then about the future of occupations, which is more precise? And I think, clearly, we don't actually know what the future of occupations will be. When you look back at the history of forecasts about technology and jobs, they were systematically wrong. And they're usually wrong even when the pronouncements come from people who are operating in the middle on the top of the changes that they're concerned with. So look, for example, at Carl Benz, the inventor in 1885 of the first practical motor car. Carl Benz believed there would be basically no market for cars because there'd be too few people with the skills to drive cars. Um, when the uh, laptop was introduced to the United States labor market, the PC, in the 1980s. Uh, more than 1,500 new job titles were created within the next 20 years. That wasn't foreseen when it happened. When smartphones came into uh, widespread use, nobody predicted the disruptive impacts on, of smartphones on a variety of niche industries, such as the firms which make magnifying glasses or metronomes, or many other industries whose functions now exist in the form of apps. So, given that um, we are operating with a degree of relative blindness about the precise details of the future, what can education and training uh, uh, policymakers do? Well, the first thing I would say is that we need to really focus on the various parameters in the education and training systems that allow a great deal of information exchange between the labor market, between employers, between, between students, between educational institutions and with parents. So for example, there need to be obligations on institutions to follow up on the long-term um, career trajectories of graduates of different programs. That information needs to go back to students. We need a lot of flexibility within education and training systems so that as students express demand for different courses as a consequence of the information that they're getting, Resources can flow flexibly across institutions and across different subject areas. So we need a lot of responsiveness within education and training systems. But there's other things that we can do too. Firstly, we need to ensure strong generic skills. These are literacy numeracy problem solving because whatever the specific technical skills of the future, this is the foundation, this is the basis from which people acquire those, special, those speciality skills. And it's the people with the high levels of generic skills who we know become lifelong learners. And we also know, interestingly, in this context when all governments have limited discretionary spending, Norway is one of the most fortunate countries in the world uh, in this regard, but we know that it's actually more to do with the quality of teachers than to do with how much money you spend to get to good outcomes in this area. Um, our work has shown that across all levels of educational attainment, from lower secondary right up to tertiary master's or research degrees, when you put people with those levels of attainment in high digital intensive environments, they need more training. So we need more investment in training overall. And we also know that it's... Yeah, sorry. We also know that there needs to be a focus on um, the persons who have low skills because it's the low skilled who participate in training at a much lower at a much lower rate than those with high skills. Um, we also see there's a big difference in skill levels between different age cohorts within our OECD economies. So if you look on the far left of the graphic, this is from our PIAC study, you see the, uh, the literacy skills which are had by the cohort of persons between 55 and 65 years of age, and you see how much lower they are as compared with the skills had by the younger cohort, 16 to 24 years old. Many things you can read into this graphic. Look at my own country, the UK, where there's basically no difference between the skills of older and younger cohorts, showing that the educational system has not improved over the course of those generations in developing skills. Compare that to Singapore, for example. 
and also see how much further ahead Singapore is than, say, the United States or, or the UK. So in any given year, when the debate about AI and skills tend to focus on universities and even on secondary education and maybe even earlier primary, but in any given year, the output of the initial education system only represents about 3% of those people who are in the labor market. So for policymakers, you need to focus on those who are already in the labor market as well to facilitate their retraining and their adjustment. We know that teachers, as I said before, are the linchpin of the education system much more important than spending per student or even to the number of students in classes and where our data show that teachers use digital technology as much as other high skilled workers but they actually have a uh, they're more likely to need training than other workers so in this context we ask in other survey work um, are you rewarded as a teacher if you're innovative in the classroom and dramatically only around a quarter of teachers feel that their, uh, their workplaces are innovation friendly. Most teachers consider, or many teachers consider, that their teaching contexts are innovation hostile, and they don't get any recognition for being innovative, whether in terms of money or other forms of, of reward. Now, my last few slides, I'm gonna concentrate on the scale of the challenge by talking about, uh, very briefly, this survey that we did, a successor to the PISA study, I actually worked for three years to, to create this survey, and this survey has measured literacy, numeracy, and problem-solving skills. In a, in a household context, we actually went to 215,000 households that agreed to do the, do the survey on a laptop, and so we got statistically representative numbers for over 800 million people across the developed world on their literacy numeracy and problem solving skills. And what PIAC does, it measures, as I say, it measures these skills which are widely used on a daily basis by adults. And because of that, there's huge public investment in education to develop these skills. And so what we've been doing with the National Academies of Science recently is to compare the performance of AI with what we know is the performance of adults across the developed world on literacy. So let me show you, these are the results then. I, PIAC, has uh, five proficiency levels. I won't go into what they signify, it would take too long. But just to say, we know where adults then sit across the developed world. Two minutes, thank you. So about 53% of all adults are at level two or below, 35% at level three. Um, no country has a majority of adults at level four and five, and on average across the OECD, 11% of adults in the general population score at this level. So how does AI perform? Well, AI can do basically everything on literacy that 53% of the population can do. It's close to doing level three, so that's, you total those two up, that's 88%. AI is close on, to doing 88% in terms of literacy skills of what the population, the adult population across the developed world can do. Um, now, the 11% is a problem. There are many things AI can't do, but there are many people who can't do those things either. So if now, clearly, in the workspace, we, do, we use many skills other than literacy, and part of our work in the future will be measuring how AI performs on those other skills, um, specialist skills, emotional skills, etc. But the point is then, uh, there are a couple of takeaways then for policy. This is my last slide. The first thing is that this OECD average of 11% of adults scoring up four and five can be, can be improved. That 11% is for the general population. When you look at the population with tertiary education, 21% of those score at level four and five, which makes them safe relative to AI as regards literacy, if you like, um, for, the, for the time being. We could move to a situation more like Japan, where a much higher share of the population has tertiary education. But a scale of the challenge is indicated by the fact that the share of the population scoring at level four and five, despite massive education spending and reform programs across the developed world since the 1990s, that share has actually fallen by two percentage points. So that's just indicating the scale of the problem to shift the skills of the entire population upward so that we can best adjust to the AI revolution, which we need. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to have a small coffee break. Uh, we are a bit behind our schedule. So we'd be really happy 
if you could go out, mingle, meet some new people and have some coffee, and then be back here by 10.20. 10.20 people. Thank you. Har du på? Ja, ok, har du en på meg på? Fordi de trenger ikke å stå der, de kan gå andre veien. Ut der også? Ja. Det er bare å åpne der, kanskje? Er den på? Er du på? For all of you guys standing in line, you can exit here. On that door, it's possible you'll get out in the same way. Yeah. Not that one. The you could take that one. Yeah, this one is better. You go up the stairs and you get into the food. What did you do now here? Det er ikke bra. Det er ikke bra. Det er ikke bra. Det er ikke bra. Og så... Jeg kan nå stemme. Så må vi ikke være der. Ja. Og så har jeg... Men jeg har jo vært litt sånn all over the place. Ja. Jeg bare finner litt ledning. Gjør det. We love your family. Yeah, that's fine. You should have. Just take one. Thank you. 